Yeah, thank you very much for inviting me to give this talk. The publication that we've recently been fortunate enough to get into the breast is, uh, I think, the culmination of many years of hard work. Yaku started this as part of his MBA thesis, but I think it's very difficult, I have to commend him, for someone that is, that is a, a non-clinician. Uh, this data is really very, very difficult to look at. And I think initially when I looked at the project, there were lots of glaring problems because there's lots of stuff you can do calculations about, but it doesn't necessarily mean that those calculations are clinically relevant. So I think that's the difficult part. So, so yeah, um, I'm Etienne, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Etienne Myberg. I'm a surgeon that based in Cape Town, we have been blessed enough that since February last year, we've been able to have a truly integrated surgical oncology unit here um, where we have all the components of surgical oncology in one place. And I think that's been a, a huge, a huge thing. And I think part of what I've always had, and I think what our unit is the whole issue of open access for colleagues, for patients, a free space to share information. We certainly, I think that's, I think one thing that we pride ourselves on is that we, we don't want to hoard our expertise. We want our expertise to be available to anyone that wants to ask. Um, and I, and I think that's, that's part of this research as well is that we are, you know, the, we be people from academics, we people from the state, we people from the private sector, um, that are all working together on a project like this. Um, and, and I think this is a testimony to. I think the whole system, Marita, I want to commend you from for you know for what you've set up is this platform that we can do this. And I, and I really hope, and I think that's that's maybe my biggest message. Uh, when I when I thought about uh, you know what should I say about this publication, was uh, you know looking back, uh, I think most of you might know Dr. Professor Stefan. She's uh, from the Medical Research Council, and she's good academic and and a few years back they published this paper and I think looking at what is the research outputs coming from the oncology sector in South Africa and one of the glaring things was that there were absolutely no economic studies that were being done in oncology and and I think that that's a huge problem because we are relying on overseas data for treatment protocols we're relying on overseas data to decide whether things are cost effective or not and, and I think the problem is we, you know, it's not always such a good fit for our healthcare system. And I think I saw that again when we did this publication. One of the big things with the reviewers, and, and if you guys were to maybe read this, it's an open access publication, so I would suggest that you read it online or download the PDF. Um, but one of the big things is that, you know, when we write something from South Africa, it's very clear that the economic model of how we fund medical treatment is not the same as it's almost everywhere else in the world. So one of the big things that, that I had to justify and, and contend with with the reviewers um, was the whole issue of, you know, why, you know, they don't understand this issue of different funders and, and, and how, how things are being funded. And I think this is probably the first economic impact study that have come from South Africa in terms of, on, of the oncology realm in a very, very long time. So I think this is really something to be proud of. Mama Print has been available in South We were one of the first countries, I think, out, outside of Europe that had Mama Print available and that it was actually being used, you know, albeit at a very limited scale, but it, the reality is it was available at probably one of the first overseas genome uh, essays that, that um, was available to South Africa and that we were able to implement in a, in a practical clinical way. So I think that was a first for South Africa. It was the only modality that actually has a central database where all of the referrals gets, gets collected in and that we actually have data and look at data. So it is the largest local data set that is not commercially driven. So this is not, it's not, doesn't belong to a medical aid. It doesn't, this is pure clinical data from practical day-to-day -day oncology patients that's being treated. And, you know, as I said, we don't know none of these modalities, no test, there's no test in South Africa in oncology that we are using that we've looked at the economic impact of that. And I, this, so this is the first uh, study in that, in that sense. 
So coming to what we did in the trial, obviously we collected uh, the data of about, you know, at that stage it was um, in about first half of last year, we had about almost 650 tumor samples uh, that was collected from 2007 up to 2020. Um, these were mainly patients who were, you know, with ERPR positive tumors, but we did have patients that have ERPR negative tumors. They were HER2 positive tumors. They were patients that had more than four nodes. Um, so we had about 10% in that group that actually fell outside of the criteria that currently would be expected for the use of mammoprint. All of these patients came from private oncology units um, and we had about 41 that we had to exclude because we didn't have complete data on those patients. So uh, still, I think quite good. Um, did a lot of you know work to try and get to that data. We used the ASCO 2013 guidelines as the uh, you know the the criteria for her to positivity um, in that subset. Um, all right. Now in the MindAct trial, they used a modified adjuvant online criteria to define patients as being clinical. So in principle, what we did, we said, all right. Let's do a clinical risk estimation on these patients. We are going to have some patients that are clinically high risk or clinically low risk. And, and obviously your clinical risk is based on things like your age and your uh, tumor grade and your lymph node status and the size of the tumor and being you know, HER2 or uh, positive or negative. But in principle, in, in the MINDAC trial, uh, this table was published in the supplementary material. This is a table that I have on my table in, in the rooms. And if I have to quickly see if a patient would qualify for mammoprint, I use that table to see if it's a clinical high risk patient. So we wanted to compare our data with MindAC to a certain extent. So we wanted to use the same thing. But as you all know, um, I, uh, adjuvant online is not available anymore. So adjuvant online just gives you, it's a clinical high risk or a clinical low risk. And that cutoff used to be like a 10% uh, cancer specific mortality. A lot of us these days use predict. Predict is also an online tool. Um, it, wor it works a bit differently to adjuvant online in the sense that it gives you a relative chemotherapy benefit in terms of how much percentage benefit you would gain from chemotherapy adding that to your you know uh, anti-estrogen therapy and stuff like that so so predict it, it, it works differently from adjuvant online it has different things it allows her two to become part of the algorithm it allows ki67 to become part of the elder algorithm but in principle that thing gave us a continuum continuum of values that said your value or your benefit for chemotherapy would be 1% or 2% or 5% or whatever the case might be. So it's, it, it looked a little bit differently in the sense that you had, you know, predict values ranging from less than 1% up to more than 7% as a, as a scale of things. Okay. Um, in that algorithm, 10% uh, is the cutoff for KI67 as being higher or positive or negative. So uh, that's the way that we used it. And then we basically used two testing strategies. He said, okay, if we just took everybody, now obviously we had 650 patients being referred for mammoprint. We had data on 601 tumors. Um, so all of those patients obviously had mammoprint. So what we have currently in South Africa is an unselective testing strategy. All of these patients came, they all had, chemo, they all had mammoprint. And what we don't know um, is we don't know if all the patients had chemo because of the mammoprint results. I definitely know of several patients that had mammoprint and in the end opted not to have chemotherapy. So not everybody complies, but in principle, the whole group had mammoprint. You had a group that was mammoprint low risk or mammoprint high risk. The high risk was a combination of patients that were clinically high and clinically low, but they all had chemo, whether you were clinically high or low, that didn't matter. We compared that to a selective testing strategy. In other words, that you would first say, okay, listen, our group consists of clinically high and clinically low patients. We're not going to test the clinical low patients. We are going to only test patients that are clinically high with mammoprint. That's going to give us a, 
60% that is mama print low and a 40% that's mama print high risk and the high risk patients are going to get chemo. So now you're going to end up with a much smaller slice of the pie that is going to have chemotherapy and also, you know, obviously you're going to test fewer patients with mama print. But the clinically low risk patients are not going to be tested. In mind act, looking at the clinically low, genomically high group of patients, there were no additional benefit. We did not have an improved survival by adding chemotherapy to that clinically low group of patients. So currently there is no published data that would support the idea that you should be treating a clinically low risk patient, let's say a five millimeter um, breast cancer, but that is mammoprint high risk. Uh, there's no support for that and no support that it would add benefit to that patient. All right, so what did we find? Obviously, now we published a series of about, I think, 120 patients back in 2006 or seven. Um, no, I'm talking nonsense, 2012 with uh, Dr. Ayn Pool. Um, and the mean age hasn't changed much. So, so in spite of publishing that article and saying very specifically, listen, you guys are referring to many low risk patients. We should be focusing more on the node positive patients and the, the slightly bigger tumors. The age has remained very much the same as about at about 53, ranging from as low as 24 up to 80 years of age. And the median tumor size was still only 17 millimeters. So T1C tumors, but you can see ranging from 0.5 millimeters. I'm not, this is not centimeters, 0.5 millimeters up to 70 millimeters. Now the 70 part, there were some patients that had non-congruent tumors. Um, so they measured the sort of total area, but you had little nests of tumor, and that's probably why we ended up with, with figures that were bigger than 50 millimeters. But as I say, there have been significant numbers of patients referred for mammoprint that really would not qualify for the standard criteria. The tumors were mainly, again, as we would expect, mainly ductal carcinomas, uh, grade 1, 2, and 3. Um, you know, that made up the vast majority of patients, uh, you know, close to 90, uh, um, 87%. And then we had 11% lobular cancers, and then we had 3% of patients that had other histologies, things like mucinous and uh, medullary and things like that. So uh, that made up. Um, and the numbers, again, as one would expect, grade 2 ductal being the most frequent grouping of patients that we would see. But... We had about, you know, 16% that were grade three. Those would probably be the concern. And then the other thing is lobulas are considered mainly sort of estrogen positive, low proliferation tumors, but we had a quite a significant group of those as well. Note positivity, you know, again, you will find that the majority, 65% of the patients were node negative. Again, showing that, you know, doctors or oncologists are referring a lot of low risk patients, clinically low risk patients, and then escalating the therapy with mammoprint, which is which is not what we you know what we really want to have but anyway so we had six patients that had more than four nodes involved again you know showing you that that falls out the out of the gambit of uh of of what you know we would expect from the trials but you know i think then you know if you have a, a low grade lobular that you know we know lobulars frequently have multiple nodes um, which has a you know very low proliferation. Uh, you know the question is you know does it help to add chemotherapy for that type of patient? So I think I can understand why some people would then maybe want to think about the possibility of doing a mama print in a case like that. Uh, most of the patients, 99% of the patients were ERPR positive, so we had 1% that were ER negative. Um, some of these patients. Um, were let's say ER negative on histology, but then subsequently uh, changed their grouping on the molecular typing. So uh, the one thing about the benefit of mammoprint is that you get blueprint with that, that you can do with it. And blueprint gives you the molecular subtype. And I think, again, that's something that lots of people don't understand or know is that they think, well, mammoprint is just a risk stratification. But there's this additional 80 genes, which basically almost functions like the PAM50, but with 80 genes that gives you the molecular subtyping, which I think helps a lot if you have a high risk patient. So uh, we had 10% of HER2 positive patients. Again, um, these are patients that are 
all of them are ERP are positive and now you have varying degrees of positivity but with a you know very low chi67 for example so you know you're concerned that you might not be dealing with a true O2 positive but that falls out of the standard um, you know referral guidelines as set out by NCCN and ASCO at this stage and then chi67 you would see that um, 20% uh, so chi67 was not done routinely until about three or three years ago so we 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 had lots of patients that we didn't that we don't know unknown is 40 percent of the patients almost but you would see that um that 45 percent or you know sort of two-thirds were chi 67 above 10 percent and uh, the other third was below so i think um uh, you know a, a good a good a good split there but i must be honest even the ones above 10 percent you'll find that lots of those are like 15 or 18 percent so um you know more patients i think if you were to use 20 percent of a cutoff you would probably see a different picture so when we used adjuvant online with a 10 percent 10 year mortality if we use that table from the mind act trial we ended up with 48 percent of patients that were clinically high risk and 52 that were clinically low risk uh, so this is in this cohort and I must, you know, looking over time, I don't, I didn't, we didn't get the feeling that we were seeing progressively more high risk patients being, um, uh, being referred. We are still seeing a majority of clinically low risk patients that are being referred for mammoprint. If you look at what happens when you do mammoprint on that, uh, so the clinically high risk group, you end up with 20, 26 versus 22 percent or 138 113 that ends up with mammoprint high risk the red one and the orange yellow one is uh, mammoprint low risk so you you still had a majority of patients that ended up being mammoprint low risk and if you took the clinically low risk group you had a lot more patients that ended up being mammoprint low uh, versus mammoprint high so you had a much smaller percentage of high risk patients but i think the concern is that group which theoretically was a clinically low risk which then obviously got escalated into chemotherapy over the course of time when we use predict we collected the data into less than one percent one to two percent two to three percent and and that is obviously the percentage of benefit that you would gain by adding chemotherapy at 10 years for a patient um, and you can see that if you look at the predict you can see there's a there's a majority of these patients will fall with a predicted chemotherapy benefit on predict of less than two percent um if you if you went up to three percent that sort of covers almost 80 percent of the referrals and if you then go to three four five you know and above seven you can see how the numbers drop off quite substantially um Interestingly, you'll see that, that that dotted line is the correlation between the percentage mammoprint high patients versus the predict value, your predict risk. So it was, it was the first publication that showed a correlation in the chance of having a high risk genomic profile based on your predicted results so if you have a predict value of less than one percent benefit for chemotherapy so in other words a clinically very low risk you can see that we had 72 patients that were mammoprint low risk and only 20 that were mammoprint high risk when we come down to let's say four to five percent you end up with 31 percent mammoprint high risk and 23 percent mammoprint low risk and if you're going towards less than more, you know, more than 7% predict value, so these are really high risk patients, you see that 18 of those were mammoprint high risk and six were mammoprint low risk. So, so there's definitely, if you were to say, listen, I am only going to test mammoprint, patient, mammoprint on patients with a predict, you know, benefit of 7%, then you are going to end up with like, you know, three quarters uh, or two thirds um high risk and only a quarter being mammoprint low risk and again that's going to make it cost ineffective so we'll look at this data in terms of what the impact would be so if you said okay listen i normally advise if i think if you have a three percent benefit for chemo then you should have then you are clinically high risk 
Uh, if you use that as a cutoff, we'll use it. What you know, we'll see what the effect of that would be. I, I, no one gives every patient that comes to them chemotherapy. So no one would say, listen, what doesn't matter what predict is, I will give everyone chemo. And I'm fairly sure that no one will say, I only use chemo if the predict value is 8%. Because again, that would be completely out of sync with what we do in practice. I think most people, if you, if you start getting to a predict, predicted chemo benefit of, you know, two to three percent, most people would start thinking about chemotherapy for patients. So in the end, what this, this is a cost impact study. So in the end is, you know, show us the money where, what happened with this. Did we save money? by preventing chemotherapy in mama print patients and in essence what we started off with we said okay if you took your patients um, and you just treated them according to your normal clinical decision making you do, you don't you don't do mama print you just treat chemotherapy if we look at these 600 and you know 600 odd patients it would have been 26.8 million rand if we tested everything, every one with mamaprint like we did in 525 patients or tumors, then the cost would be 42, 000, uh, 42 million rand. And that means it's a cost escalation of close to 60%. So we have increased the costs of chemo care or cancer care to our patients in, in over the past, you know, what's it 20 whatever years or not quite that much 15 years because we have been testing everyone and treating patients with chemotherapy so clearly even though we saved patients from chemo so we had 44 fewer patients that had chemotherapy we had the clinically high risk ones that would have gotten chemo and we reduced them by 40 percent but we had some clinically low risk ones, which we then escalated to chemotherapy. So we ended up with only about 8.4% patients, fewer patients that got chemo if we compare a mammoprint strategy with a clinical strategy. And that was a very significant cost escalation for that. So clearly an unselective mammoprint testing strategy where you are just testing everyone and treating the genomically high risk patients, not a very good idea in the first place. So what if we used a selective mammoprint testing model? In other words, we choose the clinically high risk patients and we then can we de-escalate the treatment for that group of patients. So number one is we could test almost half. We, we only tested 251 tumors. So we had fewer tumors to test. We had, we only had 113 patients that got chemotherapy in the first place. And now the cost was 21.6 million Rand which is a 20%, almost 20% um, cost saving. So in the end, we did 275 mammoth assays, which was 52% fewer tests than testing the whole group. We de-escalated 138 patients. Um, so that's a 55% de-escalation in treatment with chemotherapy. So all the clinical high patients would be considered for chemo. Now we've decreased the number that got chemo by 55%. And that was a 5.2 million Rand cost saving. Um, and that is a very, very significant cost saving. There are very few strategies that you can employ in oncology that will give you a 20% cost saving. So looking at that strategy, we said, well, there's, there, there should be a point if we think that print cost might be going up and let's say chemotherapy cost might be coming down or if you're working in a government setting where the cost of chemotherapy might be less uh, or you are just giving all your patients cmf where it's like dirt cheap uh you know is it still going to give me the same amount so the, the 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 money value that we determined all these things on was we looked at what did the average cost for treating a patient for with chemotherapy cost in 2020 looking at the icon uh, ranges of treatment options now again it's not just a single treatment and no one said well you can only use this you can only that this was real data this was data that was generated by clinical oncologists in south africa for 2020 and we use that calculation so obviously if you are the type of person that now works in tigerberg and everybody just gets ac times four 
costs are going to be different. So we said there must be a way that we can calculate this uh, for when would MAMA print be cost effective. And in principle, what it works out as mathematically is if your, if your MAMA print cost percentage wise or fraction wise of the chemotherapy cost is less than the number of mammoprint low patients. In other words, if you can de-escalate a higher percentage than that uh, fraction of mammoprint versus uh, chemotherapy cost, then you are going to have a cost benefit. That is your break even point. So we use that to try and, and see what we can do. All right. So we said, well, um, in, in, in 2020, uh, the average cost for giving chemotherapy, that includes supportive care, uh, you know, bone marrow support. Uh, it didn't include traveling to the chemotherapy unit or, you know, the work that you had to you take off work or stuff like that. It was direct costs that the funder paid for someone getting chemotherapy was 106,000 rand. So it includes some complications, it includes patients that didn't, that get, you know, got some cheaper chemotherapy regimens, but that was the average cost for chemotherapy. And that gives us a break-even ratio of 35.5%. So if Mamaprint costs 35.5% of your chemo cost, you will, you, uh, you will de-escalate patients if you can reduce the amount of patients getting chemotherapy by more than 35%. Now, we decreased chemo costs or chemo use by 55%. So that's why we came at as a positive result in a de-escalation strategy. So this is sort of, this is telling you that story. So in principle, if we use predict as our cutoff and you say, well, this is our break even line using our current figures. Okay, that's 35%. If we used a predict value, if we decide, okay, listen, everybody in our practice with a predict value, more than 2% is going to be given chemotherapy. Then I can say, well, at 2%, this is going to be my de-escalation amount. I'm going to de-escalate 45, 54% of patients. So it's going to be cost beneficial. And you can see the, these, um, these are, are confidence intervals that have been placed in here. So that you can see. So you can see now once we get to sort of 3, 3.5%, now the numbers of patients that we have start dwindling down and the 95% confidence interval starts crossing that line. So now we don't know if it's a real problem or not, but in principle, up to about 3%, we can definitely say that at current costs, mammoprint is going to be cost effective. So even if you say, I'm going to de-escalate, uh, I'm going to only treat patients above 3% benefit with chemo, and I'll do mammoprint on them, then you're still going to have a cost benefit. Um, and I think that's a very realistic thing. I am um, in the uh, in um, in the uh, in in Britain. Um, there's some units that have a three percent. That's their official statement that if you if you have a, a predict value above three, then you should be co given chemotherapy. So um, at that point, we can reduce chemotherapy use by forty two percent, and we will have a cost saving still of eight percent with a p value under 0.5. If we have more figures, if people start sending us more high-risk patients, we might find that obviously the higher cutoff values. But I think most people will start thinking about chemo somewhere between 2 and 3% for most patients. All right. So in summary, Mammoprint is a very valuable essay. It is something that gives you data beyond our normal clinical information and our normal pathological information. It gives me a risk. And it gives me, if I use Blueprint, it gives me a molecular typing, which I cannot get from my pathological information. We are still seeing that the majority of people that are referred are clinically low risk. If we use PREDICT, we see that a lot of patients that are referred have PREDICT benefit values of like under 1% or 2%. So, so we need to start changing our referral behavior so that people can realize, wait a minute, Mammoprint is a de-escalation tool. It is not an escalation tool and it shouldn't be used for that. If we are not, if we're using it as we are currently doing, we are creating cost escalation. We are making the test cost ineffective and we are incurring more costs. We are not, we have no, we don't have long-term survival data. We don't have 
cost effectiveness trials for South Africa that says, okay, you know, we are gaining X amount of qualities. There, there is a trial that we are trying to see if we can do that, but currently we don't know that. So I would be very doubtful, it would be very doubtful um, that patients that are being escalated in therapy will have a survival benefit that would result in a cost effectiveness benefit for this. So we would strongly advise, based on what we've seen here, is that we would stick to the guidelines from ASCO to say that this is a test that should be used for ERPR positive patients with one to three nodes and tumors under five centimeters. Um, we should not be, and we should be using it as a de-escalation modality and not in an escalating um, uh, setting and I think that's really important and if we do that we can really have substantial cost saving from that so yeah it's um, we need more data like this I'm hoping um, you know anytime I talk to groups I always say you know this is a this is a model for collaborative research generating data when they started you know we had a few data but now we've you know we've got big data sets that we can start working with so this is a model that can really be something that we should be using in South Africa to, to generate our own data. This is published in a peer-reviewed international journal. So even though it's coming from us and it's published in RANS, it's still something that, that uh, international readership is interested in hearing about. So I think, yeah, I want to congratulate my co-authors um, who's labored through this with, with me um, and um, I think we can be proud about this. That's the link uh, for accessing it. It's in the Journal of Breast. Um, in May, it's, uh, it was accepted in May. Um, I think the final version is only available now online. Um, and as I said, it's open access. So please um, go and, 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 um, and take a look at that. Uh, yeah, and with that, I thank you.